Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. <laughs> About a year ago, I made a pretty mixed review of Better Call Saul. And, yeah, you know, the response was pretty good. Honestly, I didn't mind the backlash too much because half the negative comments were legitimately constructive and helpful, offering valid reasons for why my mindset when watching the series for the first time was fundamentally flawed, thereby tainting my analysis of it. And the other half of negative responses were just extremely funny. My favorite thing was when people contacted Surfshark and asked them to drop me as a sponsor because I liked but didn't love Funny Lawyer Show. Like, that's so petty that I can picture Chuck McGill doing that. Imagine being on the same level as Chuck McGill. Truly embarrassing. But for the most part, yeah, this was a very flawed analysis for quite a few reasons. I think one of the main reasons is that I tried way too hard to find the Breaking Bad equivalent to a lot of plot lines and episodes, which resulted in a lot of unfair comparisons. I went into the series too hung up on the fact that people told me it was better than Breaking Bad, which means I didn't really give the show on its own a fair shake. For instance, the stuff with Mike is definitely better than I gave it credit for and adds a lot of dimension to his character. Obviously, he's not going to go through as much of a dramatic character shift as Walter White did, and that's okay. It's still evident that he's compromising his morals as he works for Gus more and more, and his arc over the course of the series isn't meant to be directly compared to Walter's. Ultimately, I still do prefer the Jimmy plotline over the Mike one, but I can at least acknowledge that the Mike stuff is strong and deserves more respect. Speaking of which, I was very dismissive of Nacho, even though he legit did have some of that Walter White appeal of a regular dude who slowly gets taken in by crime. Looking back on his role in the show and how sad it is that he constantly got used by the far more evil people around him, yeah, I can safely say that he was a more than worthwhile addition to the show, and I'll talk more about him in a bit. I also neglected to mention a lot of very positive aspects of this show in my initial review. For instance, it's just shot a lot better than Breaking Bad. The show can get stupid artsy with some of its cold opens, and the cinematography and lighting are both top notch. They really give the show a cinematic feel that puts most other television shows to shame. There's a lot of fun and memorable side characters like the Kettlemans, the nerd with the baseball cards, and the film slash theater kids who help Jimmy out with his scams. Speaking of which, there's nothing quite like watching a slippin' Jimmy scheme unfold, especially when they don't explain what he's doing or why he's doing it right away, and you have to piece it together for yourself. The man's a tactical genius, and his schemes make for great entertainment. So yeah, a lot of great stuff in this show, and a lot of mistakes made in my original video. But none of these were my reasons for wanting to make a follow-up video, rather than just an apology tweet or something. The reason I knew I had to get this all in video form is because of Season 6. The final season of Better Call Saul didn't just stick the landing, it nailed it so hard that it made me reevaluate all of the previous seasons and realize that I was such a fool for calling this series anything less than brilliant. Here's the thing, an ending can have such a dramatic, transformative impact on everything that came before. It can make everything that you previously didn't see the purpose of finally click in your eyes, making you realize that the slow burn was absolutely worth the wait. As an example, there's the movie Drive My Car. It's three hours long, and for the entire first half, I just did not get why it had to be that way. It was slow, and it didn't seem to be going anywhere. And while I thought it was solid, I absolutely didn't see the point of every little detail. But then, in the second half, Everything finally clicked and came together. Everything that seemed like overly long and drawn out setup was paid off beautifully, and I realized how profound the commentary on loss and grief was. It shattered me emotionally, and I don't think it would be nearly as effective without every little detail in the first half. That perfectly set the second half up to just knock it out of the park. I was thinking of giving the movie a 6 out of 10 during the first half, and I ended up giving it a 9 out of 10 when it was over. Better Call Saul is in a similar boat. It's a deliberately slow and methodical show, and I, rather idiotically, didn't appreciate the fact that it was clearly building to something because I couldn't see what that something was. I tried comparing it to Breaking Bad, which was dumb for a number of reasons, but one of those reasons is that we already saw the full arc of Breaking Bad's story. I know some people think Breaking Bad should have ended after season 4 with Gus's death. 
But I wholeheartedly disagree. You need that final season that completes Walt's transformation and shows that he's become the main villain of the show. You need the payoff of Hank finally realizing that Walt is Heisenberg and trying to take him down. You need the deterioration of Walt's family life and for his crimes to finally catch up to him. And you need Ozymandias, which is still probably the greatest episode of television I've ever seen. So, to compare a show with an excellent, brutal, conclusive final season that pays everything off masterfully, to a show that was still building to a final season that was yet to come out? Oh, that's stupid! Especially because Better Call Saul was more clearly building to the final season in order to tie everything together than Breaking Bad was. Honestly, most of my criticisms of the first five seasons are kind of moot now. Like I said, I didn't give Nacho enough credit, and the thing that really woke me up to how impactful of a character he was is that final episode with him. His phone call to his dad legitimately made me cry a bit, and once I saw that final scene with him and realized that he's the one who set in motion the deaths of all these assholes around him, it was simultaneously really cathartic and tragic. He never should have gotten caught up in any of this, but as long as he did, mocking Hector and calling him a twisted fuck on his way out was a genuinely incredible moment. And the fact that Mike clearly regrets what happened with Nacho enhances the part of Breaking Bad where he takes Jesse under his wing and tries to protect him. This is good ass prequel writing right here. And there's other criticisms I had that have been completely obliterated by this season. Oh, the process of how the meth lab was made didn't feel necessary? Boom, Lalo dedicates the season to investigating and uncovering it. And it becomes the location of his final showdown with Gus and ultimately his burial place. Oh, Gus doesn't do anything interesting in the show? Boom! He not only gets to personally take out Lalo, but he gets a chance to say the venomous words he never got to tell Don Eladio during the pool poisoning scene in Breaking Bad, thus rounding out his entire character incredibly well. Oh, the Gene stuff felt completely disconnected from the rest of the show and didn't acknowledge that Walter White is the person that brought Jimmy to the place he's at now? Boom! It's Walter White! There he is! We are indeed acknowledging that Saul shouldn't have put all his eggs in the Walter basket, thus offering some connective tissue between the stories of Jimmy and Gene. Oh, the Jimmy and Mike sides of the show feel incredibly disconnected from each other? Well, that's to make the moment where the two sides of Jimmy's life finally intersect as earth-shattering as possible. We'll get to that in a sec. First, I just wanted to say that the Jimmy and Kim plotline for the first half of the season was focused, entertaining, and incredibly executed. Seeing them go out of their way to elaborately prank Howard for no other reason than they get off on it is delightful and shows how far they fell, especially Kim. It's a much more interesting thing for Jimmy to be doing than selling cell phones to people, and Kim continues to prove that she's one of the most fascinating and well-written characters in the entire Breaking Bad universe. And the anticipation of watching these schemes against Howard unfold is just delightful. Plan and execution is pretty handily my second favorite episode in the entire series. And not just because of the ending, but because the middle of the episode evokes the exact same vibes as my favorite episode of the series, Chicanery. Speaking of which, I just want to sidebar for a sec and say how weird it is to get comments on the original video that claim I only wanted to see action from Better Call Saul. My brothers in Christ, I told you that my favorite episode of the whole show was nothing but a court battle. What are you talking about? But I digress. As great as Howard's downward spiral is, it's the ending that really clenches this as an all-time classic. The fact that the lawyer and cartel worlds of the show feel so separate is what really enhances the unnerving nature of this scene. Howard and Lalo feel like two characters that should never meet. Because if they do, then yeah, yeah, that, 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 that would happen. Much like Drive My Car, I feel like this dramatic, explosive intersection of two different worlds wouldn't be nearly as dramatically potent without the six seasons of subtle buildup. If the Jimmy and Mike stuff crossed over all the time, it wouldn't make this moment as strong as it was. Dare I say it? Bravo, Vince. No, but for real though, bravo Thomas Schnaz, because he wrote and directed this episode. The very next episode was directed by Vince though, and that one's fantastic too, so my bravo Vince still stands. I feel like I don't really need to sell you on how great episodes 7 and 8 of season 6 were. It's pretty obvious that the climax of the whole show would be incredibly strong, intense, and all that good shit. However, I did want to talk about episode 9, Fun and Games. The one that essentially concluded the Jimmy McGill storyline in truly heartbreaking fashion. You really get the sense that Jimmy died the moment Kim left him, and their final scene together is insanely powerful. 
Like, I also cried at this. It really put it into perspective for me how the entire series was a twisted love story about two messed up people struggling to be good, but ultimately succumbing to their toxic desires. Kim was probably right to leave Jimmy for the good of everyone else around them, even if it meant sacrificing the deep romantic connection they had. It's such phenomenal drama, and at some point, even a former hater like me has to take a step back and say, how did they do this? How did they turn the funny haha -ha lawyer man from Breaking Bad, where he had barely any dimensionality or sympathetic traits, into one of the most tragic protagonists on television? He lost his entire family, the love of his life, and his soul over the course of this series. And while he was self-destructive and it's arguable that he deserved it to some extent, it's like, fuck man. He wanted to be better, but his brother didn't believe in him and actively hindered his progress at every turn. His wife encouraged him to slip farther and farther into immorality. He got caught up in cartel business he was woefully unprepared for. His dog died of a broken heart. Just so much tragic shit, adding so many dimensions to what was previously the fucking comic relief of Breaking Bad. That's truly one of the most incredible writing feats in all of television. And that's not even getting into how tragic Kim is, or how skewed Mike's sense of justice has become, or Nacho's tragic fall from grace, or Howard's unfortunate end, or even Gus getting so consumed by revenge that he can't even have gay thoughts about this bartender guy anymore. Alright, yeah! You got me! This is a great show! I think it's a lot easier to see that now that I don't have the events of Breaking Bad vividly playing in the back of my mind anymore. With some time and some distance, I can really appreciate Better Call Saul for really standing on its own and offering a powerful, deconstructive look at the fall of numerous compelling characters. Do I think this show is better than Breaking Bad? The answer's still no, but now I can totally see why someone would think that it is. A lot of elements are legit stronger, like the cinematography, plus some of the character work and writing they do here. But for me personally, I'll always prefer the singular focus of Breaking Bad showing the moral degradation of Walter White, who I still consider to be the most compelling character in this entire universe. And I'll admit, while I have come to appreciate the Mike stuff and the cartel stuff in Better Call Saul more than I did previously, I still vastly prefer the Jimmy plotline, and I wish the focus of the show wasn't so evenly divided between Jimmy and Mike, considering that it is called Better Call Saul after all. But even though I don't love all the cartel stuff, and some of the bits of the Jimmy plotline are a little bit slow, it's absolutely worth watching it all to see the incredible fall of Jimmy McGill unfold. It really does feel like an essential part of the Breaking Bad universe now, with Jimmy being one of my favorite characters in this universe solely because of this show, and not Breaking Bad. And speaking of Breaking Bad, we'd better talk about those last four episodes that perfectly bridge the gap between the two shows and ultimately make this feel like one continuous 11 season story. It was a bold choice to make the ending of this show practically inaccessible to anyone who hasn't seen Breaking Bad, but I guess they are banking on the fact that most people would watch Breaking Bad first anyway. So yeah, great string of episodes that perfectly connected the Gene stuff to everything else. Nippy was a super fun standalone Slippin' Jimmy scheme episode, with Gene's emotional breakdown definitely being the highlight. Also, it made me hungry for Cinnabon. The episode Breaking Bad was a little all over the place, but still a great way of showing what a terrible mistake Saul made by going down the Walter Road, as well as illustrating that Gene can't just quit while he's ahead in terms of doing these scams. And then there's Waterworks and Saul Gone, my third and fourth favorites in the whole show, both of which made me cry for the third and fourth times this season. Yeah, I'm kind of a mess, but like, can you blame me? The emotions really ran high in these episodes, with Kim's written confession and breakdown on the bus not just being heartbreaking in their own right, but also serving as a great contrast to Jean's heinous actions. Kim is out here owning up to her crimes and trying to make things right, while Jean's walking up to Marion with legit serial killer energy as he tries to bury his horrible actions yet again. And don't even get me started on the divorce scene. Like, imagine disassociating yourself from your true feelings so much that you treat the love of your life so dismissively like that. It all paints a picture of a man who's completely succumbed to immorality because it's all he has left. And it's like, poor Kim, holy shit. I couldn't take the Jesse scene as seriously because of how goofy the character is at this point in the timeline, but I guess it's pretty cool that Kim and Jesse met, so sure, still a good scene. And Saul gone. 
What can I say that hasn't already been said? It was so beyond moving to see that Jimmy McGill wasn't dead after all, as he owned up to everything he did. It's a perfect ending for a character who suffered and wronged others in equal measure. The time machine motif was brilliant, and the flashback scenes with Chuck, Walt, and Kid Named Finger were all incredible from a thematic standpoint. I can't believe they made me happy to see Chuck again. Imagine that. More than anything, it was so beyond powerful to finally see Jimmy and Kim together again one last time. I care about them both so much, and I think they got the best possible send-offs that Peter and Vince could have given them. For real. Bravo. So yeah, my mind has been thoroughly changed on this show, can you believe it? I'm sure there's gonna be some people in the comments who claim that I'm only changing my tune because of the backlash to the previous video, which, honey, the video's been up for over a year now and I haven't removed it or disabled comments. I really don't care if people disagree with me on something. Nah, man. I made this follow-up video because I legitimately changed my mind after watching season 6. Not because I suddenly wanted to save face after an entire year of leaving my previous opinion out there. I didn't make this video to appease the haters. I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. So yeah, I'm not deleting the previous video because I don't really believe in burying unpopular opinions. If anyone wants to see what my mindset on the show was like a year ago, you still can. Just with a disclaimer title stating that my opinions in that video aren't accurate anymore. After all, I'd much rather follow by Jimmy's example in the finale and own up to my mistakes, rather than trying to bury and downplay them. At the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is that Better Call Saul sucks, and also Breaking Bad sucks, and Slippin' Jimmy is the best show on television! Woo! Slippin' Jimmy sweep, baby! One slip million tickets! I-I-I I can't believe the show is real, like, what 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 Are you kidding me? Are you out of your mind? Oh yeah, I just remembered that we never found out what happened to Jeff. Well, the good news is, Marion can probably find tons of information on how to free him from jail using her handy dandy computer. And you know what else she can do with that computer? Make a website using Squarespace. Squarespace is a fantastic, intuitive, online website builder that allows you to create beautiful websites for your business or personal hobby. Present your work using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs. Display projects in customizable galleries and add password-protected pages to share private works with clients. You can even present your videos from YouTube, Vimeo, and Animoto on your Squarespace site. Add an image overlay to your video to improve your website's load speed by waiting to embed video players until playback starts. Starts. Every design automatically includes a unique mobile presence that matches the overall style of your website, so your content will look great on every device, every time. And if you don't want that, you can always disable the mobile view from Website Manager. Buying a domain from Squarespace is so simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Each domain comes with an ad-free parking page and free WHOIS privacy on eligible domains. Squarespace sells over 200 top-level domains so you can find the perfect name for your website. Choose a URL that ends in .com, .net, .org, or you can always get a more specific one like .art if you want to be fancy. If you're ready to share your passions or promote your business with the rest of the world, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.